American accent. Guido Van Rossum. <laughs> hey, everybody. You know, one of the things that I love about Guido is that he is always willing to share his opinion. <laughs> and so I was thinking about, I was thinking that the first question that I, that, that I might ask or just sort of kick over to Guido is whether we were going to have Python 2.8. Um, and so Guido is truly, he is the... He's a, not only the benevolent dictator for life, but he's part, he is the guiding force that helps keep us all in line, at least, at least programming language-wise. So without further ado, Guido Van Rossum. Thank you, Van. Well, Van's a hard act to follow, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, I have a question for the organization. Is it possible to have microphones out there so some people can ask questions, or am I too late with that request? There are microphones. There are microphones. Okay, well, then let me go to my other slide. So, to be honest, I always stress out for a keynote, and this year it was worse and I had a total, complete mental block. Because the thing I really want to do is give you another super technical, excited talk about Tulip, Async IO, 3156. But there were like three or four talks in the regular program already that explained it better than I could. I did that talk last year. I did it again at the San Francisco Python Meetup. I did, I did it again at the Bay Area Python Interest Group. I really don't want to sort of repeat myself in that way. So I was really thinking, oh my god, what can I do? Maybe, maybe I should just read from fan mail. <laughs> because I get a lot of fan mail. And if, if, you're, if you've got a sort of certain type of brain, it's all very funny. But actually, then I thought about it, and I thought, well, probably some of the people who wrote me that fan mail are in this audience, and I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to embarrass myself. And maybe it's not actually that funny. So I collected, I asked on Twitter, what should I talk about? I sort of wrecked my brain every time I had sort of a brain wave. Oh, I should talk about that. I just added it to a list, and then finally, uh, last night, I collated all the lists I had, put them in a text file, and I thought, oh, I'm going to pick randomly. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually write the code that will randomly pick <laughs> something from the list. <laughs> that'll, that'll give me some time to breathe. Also, uh, I would love to take questions, and as you can see, I, today, I'm making a choice to only take questions from women in the audience. Because throughout the conference, I've been attacked by people with questions, and they were almost all men. So I think the women have sort of, they're a little behind, and they can catch up here. Uh, let me see, how can I find my UI? Bingo. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Well, we'll need a random number generator, I think. Oh, dear. Uh, mirror the display. How do that? That is very sad. Uh, PowerPoint is too clever. One second. Now, how do I get rid of it? Do you see that? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, let's see. What, what was the rest of the plan? Let's define a function. Uh, let's pick a question. Now, let's see. We probably have a global variable. 
Okay, we have a list of questions, but it's not yet initialized. Actually, I can, can yeah, no, I want, it, I want it uninitialized initially. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can sort of get a peek in, into my brain by hearing me talk about what I'm, what I'm doing while programming. So we have a list of questions, and we do something like, if the list of questions is empty, we're going to have to initialize it. So what shall we initialize it to? Questions is open some file. Sorry, what was that? Ah, well, see, I'm so glad we, we, we have static type analysis here. <laughs> Live static type analysis. We should, we should all have that in, in our software, an opinionated uh, co-programmer who tells you when you're screwing up. Okay, and then we're going to use return random dot choice. Well, let's, shall, we, shall we just try this? <laughs> let's try this. Let's, let's see if I can remember how to run it. Source must be saved, sure. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I know several of you already saw this coming, so. Uh. Well, this is really weird. Clearly an idle bug. I can't, I can't get my cu cursor there where I want it. <laughs> so this is, this is sort of, this is a taste of what students trying to learn Python are going through in real life sometimes. And somehow I managed to solve my problem, yes. And save and run. Geekdom. It, I think there was a line that just said geekdom in my list of questions. So let me see what I can ad lib about geekdom. Uh, I'm a terrible geek myself. I mean, who on earth would write such a stupid program in front of 2,000 people? <laughs> and think they can get away with it. It's, it's, it's like a sign of absolute, total lack of social skills. <laughs> last, last night I discovered one of, one of my geekish charms is I do not know how to extract myself from a conversation. Many of you have profited from that. Many others of you <laughs> have wondered when I was ever done. Okay, let's, let's pick a different question. Uh, I can probably just type it here. Oppose the idea of exception expressions. That sounds like half a question, but I think what it comes from, and it's probably one of those things I copied and pasted from Twitter, there's been a very elaborate pep that Propose that we add a new type of expression to Python. I guess it's going to have to be added to Python 3.5 if we're going to do it. And it would like, let, um, actually, hey, I, have, I, I can type here. I can, I can show what it was supposed to look like. Something like x is uh, d of 5 for except. Uh, let's, let's, say, let's say, except it's a key error, and if it was a key error, we'll say it's none. Now, obviously, this is not currently valid syntax, so, but that's what it would look like. And there are a whole, the, the, the pep goes on at length in all the incredibly 
good use cases where currently you have to write a four-line try accept block to do some very simple thing, and we have a whole bunch of methods in the standard library on various function objects that are only there, according to the author of this PEP, the authors, to, to sort of deal with the fact that you, you can't catch an exception sort of concisely. And I'm still, I'm still against this idea. I think it's an ugly syntactic word to add this. Uh, the colon in the syntax drives me nuts, but any other syntax proposal that has, has been sort of considered for the path looks even nuttier to me. And I really don't think that there is a big problem to be, that, that's being solved here. The problem is that sometimes people want to put everything in one line. And I think that's just, that's an urge you should try to resist and just be, take a pause, take a breath. It's okay to, to spend a few extra words. We're not, we're not Pearl. Uh, okay. Enough on that topic. Let's pick another question. Kiwi. Who here even knows what Kiwi is? Oh, that's awesome. Who has ever used Kiwi? Well, so Kiwi is more popular than I thought. I don't know if any of the Kiwi people, developers, are here. Kiwi is, in theory, this great tool that you can use to write Python code on your mobile devices. And it has a backend. It actually, it has sort of implementations or backends, what you can want to call them, that run on iOS or on iPad or on iPhone, but also on Android. And you can also run your program uh, in the browser or on the desktop. And, I mean, I may be mentioning some use cases that aren't actually yet implemented, but Kiwi sort of lets you write beautiful user interface applications that will run on a variety of platforms, including mobile devices. Unfortunately, when I talked to the people at home at work uh, at Dropbox who are developing apps for, for mobile devices, Dropbox just launched a few new apps for mobile devices this week, they said, well, we would love to be able to use that, but it's not fast enough. And I think the Kiwi people deserve incredible kudos for starting it, but they need help. They need, they need more technical expertise for all those different phone platforms and for Python to help them make it faster, to help maybe build a community around Kiwi that is is larger so that Kiwi can actually be successful because Python doesn't have a story for mobile devices. And if Kiwi is the only story for mobile devices we have, we need to work a lot on that story. So if you have interest in hacking on something incredibly cool that will benefit everybody who is, go who is eventually going to be using mobile devices, and Mobile devices will get better, and lots of things will, will sort of open up once you support mobile devices. We've got to get Python in the phones. And waiting for Ubuntu Mobile or Mozilla Mobile OS, I don't think that that's, it, that's the, the sort of the successful strategy for actually getting Python on the phones. OK, enough about that question. What's the next one? How awesome is Python 3.4? Yeah, have you checked it out yet? It is awesome. It is the best Python ever. <laughs> and it's incredibly accessible. It is also easier than ever to port code from Python 2 to Python 3 or to write code that works both in Python 2 and Python 3. 3.4 is the biggest step, I would say, towards making everyone happy. And please go use Python 3.4, even if your main project is still written in Python 2. Start 
getting yourself used to Python 3, download Python 3.4, install it as the alternate Python interpreter on every system you have. Play around with it. The NumPy folks are very close to switching to Python 3 already. If you're a web developer using Flask or Django, well, there are some theoretical ports, but it's still hard. But give it a try. And if you find something that doesn't work with Python 3 yet, help someone. Make it work. As, as Van said, we are this community, and we can, we can make it happen. And yes, we can, we can all work on being a community, and it's us and us, and community, community. But there is a lot of software that needs to be improved and fixed and, and, and sometimes thrown away. And that's, that's what this community is for. So please help us. Does anyone have a question yet? Will, will 2.8 be 3.6? You're not a woman. <laughs> can, you, can you get your girlfriend to ask that question? I'll start us off. Yes. Other side. I'm curious what you think the worst part of contributing to CPython is today. You mean the, the, the worst part of the experience of, of trying to contribute? Whatever is the biggest headache for you. For, well, for me personally, there aren't very many headaches. <laughs> what the sort of, but what I worry about most is that it is so incredibly difficult to get started. Uh, it, it used to be that, that sort of when I first wrote C Python, I mean, it was the most complex code I had ever written, but I tried to write it as sort of straightforward and simple and clear as possible. And for years, people said, wow, you got you to gotta read the C code for Python because it's so clear and you can actually understand how the language works. But then generations of people have added contributions and we added Unicode and various slow things were improved so they were faster and there's a custom memory allocator. And the code is actually not straightforward at all anymore. And so it's very easy to sort of think, oh, here's, here's, a, here's a little bug in Python. I bet I can fix that. Let's look it up in the source code and be completely overwhelmed. And sort of you find, well, I also talk to a lot of people who say, well, I'm a Python programmer, I don't know any C. So it's sort of, which, which is shocking for me because when I wrote, when I started Python, I mean, every, everybody was a C programmer and then maybe they would also learn some other languages like Perl or Python. So what sort of, I don't know exactly what we can do to get people into contributing more, but I agree there is, there is a difficulty in getting started. And, and here I'm just talking about the technical difficulty of understanding the code and finding out how it's organized and finding where the thing that sort of you, you see something wrong happening, figuring out where in the C code that, that wrong decision is being made is far from, from simple. You may have to run a debugger. You may have to grab all the source for magic strings. Uh, it's often sort of in, indirect phenomena rather than there's just a line of code that does the wrong thing. So unfortunately, that puts the bar for successful contributions very high. And this is even before we get to the point of, well, if you have fixed something successfully, now you have to con convince a core, de a core developer to give your patch the light of day, look at your bug report, look at your patch, give you feedback, help you sort of make it also work on all the other platforms we care about. So I would, I would love if we could sort of smoothen out that process. Uh, it used to be that I was the one who did all that, and sort of I would sometimes take shortcuts. Now there, there are too many contributions and too many open bugs and too many lingering patches for me to be very successful in 
taking care of all that, even though I, I want to. But everyone else who is sort of really knowledgeable and all, basically all the people who can review your patch are already very busy. And so the question is, how do we grow that set of people? How do we get more people into the core? Sort of, and it, it's a high bar to pass. You have to sort of first win the trust of the existing core developers because we, we also don't want a bunch of newbies sort of changing Python and add new features that don't actually work or will, will distract uh, other users or break on certain platforms. So there is, there is a real sort of reason for, for having thorough technical review for all contributions, but at the same time, that, that review process and the process of getting new people involved has become very heavyweight and cumbersome. So that, that is, is, is something that does worry me, and thanks for, for asking. Thank you. So this question is about uh, Python 3.4. When I uh, teach a class, um, we often have this conversation of what version of Python to use. Mm -hmm. And um, we often uh, do not use uh, 3.4, we'll go 2.7. And we, I go through the process of explaining it, and it's a hard thing for new people to understand why we would be using why you would want to use 2.7 over 3.4 when in every other aspect of our lives you always want to be on the newest and greatest and best. And so my question for you is um, with small incremental changes that are happening in the community as people upgrade libraries, um, when do you see the tipping point happening where there is a large majority sort of taking a lot of action to move over to 3.4? Because I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I personally feel like it hasn't gained as much momentum as, as I would hope. That's a very valid concern. Uh, I am personally very optimistic that this will sort itself out. Now, how exactly will, will it sort itself out? My, my sort of, what, what I see, I talk to people in different sub-communities. I talk to educators, I talk to scientists, I talk to web developers, I talk to system administrators, and everybody actually sort of has a different view. There are people who say, well, when I teach a class, I don't use any third-party libraries, and I just use the turtle module that's in the standard library. And I'm so happy with Python 3 because, like, these 10 things that used to always trip my students over in class when I was using Python 2 to teach have all gone away. You, thank you for listening to our complaints about Python 2 and changing the input function and this and that. And so there is a group of people who are really ahead of the game. There are other people who write large sort of new code and they they like to do everything themselves. And they also say, oh, wow, let, I can use the async I.O. library in Python 3.3 or 3.4. I am so excited. I'm going to write my whole new framework based on Python 3 using async I.O. Uh, I'm super excited about this. Then there are the people who have 16 million lines of code written by 3,000 sort of mediocre skill programmers. Uh, and it's, it's all Python 2.7, but m half of it is probably actually was written in the days of Python 2.3, and it just, by the grace of God, still is compatible with 2.7, or every once in a while they, the, someone fixes it when, it when it breaks, but not before it breaks. And those people have no... They're, they're just completely overwhelmed by how on earth are we going to get this much code in, in, written in a dynamic language where there are no type declarations, the compiler is okay with almost anything you type. How are we going to get this code ported over to Python 3 and, and sort of still be assured that the output is 
correct because that's really what we care about. And, and so I think there, there is an incredible spectrum. It turns out from talking to various people in the numerical or scientific Python world that those guys are actually ahead of the web developers. The NumPy world has more successfully not only ported the software, but is in the process of porting the community to Python 3. They asked for a matrix multiply operator in Python 3. They're getting it in 3.5, which is still a year and a half down the road. But they're already excited about it. And, and that, by itself, is giving them a lot of motivation to sort of be ready when that matrix multiply operator arrives in the language. Uh, my colleagues at Dropbox are not so excited about porting to Python 3 because they've got a huge live code base and, and there are like dozens of developers who add more to it every day. Many of those developers have sort of tunnel vision. They're focused on one particular feature or one particular abstraction. And there's no one who has a good overview over sort of what, what would happen if we try to run this in the Python 3. And even with smaller code bases that we have at Dropbox that are somewhat separate from that, uh, we've, we've found that if you, if you sort of use every hack in the book, then, then many of those hacks are going to, to not work with the next version of Python. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Patience. Let sort of don't, don't worry. You don't bang your head against the wall because you're behind the curve. There are plenty of people who are still happily running Windows XP on their computers too. <laughs> maybe, may, maybe not so happily after Microsoft uh, stops the support, but nevertheless, uh, they're still running XP. But it'll be many, many years before Python 2.7 is sort of abandoned by the Python core developers. I admit that when we first planned Python 3 uh, and the transition, we thought that five years was a really long time because for me personally, I, I'm bad at predicting in the future and I'm really bad at looking, say, five years or more. When people ask me what's gonna happen in 10 years, I just throw my hands up in the air. So we, we set what we thought was a conservative trajectory for how long we would support Python 2.7. There is a PEP that declares the end of life for Python 2.7, something like May 2015, which is actually in a little over a year. We just had a long discussion about that topic at the Language Summit earlier this week. And we're going to update that PEP, and we're going to make it clear that while we still want everyone to think about moving, and we're going to sort of help people port, and I hope many of you went to, for example, Trace Seaver's talk about porting to Python 3 and the specific strategy of writing single source code that can execute correctly both under Python 2 and Python 3 for, for high enough versions of Python 2. Uh, and we're going to pour more resources in helping people make sort of that porting process successful, but the help is not going to come in the form of compromised versions of Python. The help is going to come in the form of tools plus specific help in porting stragglers in the, the sort of the dependency ecosystem. Like if there is a particular module that still hasn't been ported to Python 3 and that is holding people back, uh, the PSF. Uh, or other organizations that have, have some interest in this will be able to help. Uh, so what, what you can do yourself is A, don't panic. B, be opportunistic. Sort of, you probably have a whole bunch of different Python projects. See if there's one of your projects where you can use Python 3 and sort of become comfortable with print as a function and learn to use all the cool new uh, Unicode support and uh, bytes versus text. 
And so five years from now, I'll be standing here again and I'll uh, be looking back and I think we'll be in a much, much better situation. And, and 15 years from now, we'll all sort of look back and laugh about when we were all so worried about uh, the Python 2 to 3 transition. And I never want to do another transition in the same way. Fortunately, software changes so fast and, and sort of better tools become available that whatever the next step is that we're going to have to take beyond three, uh, we'll be able to plan taking that step in a very different way and we won't have, have to have discussions like that, this. Thank you. Hey, what's up, Guido? Uh, I'm a bioinformatics graduate student, and I love Python, especially the scientific Python stack. However, I do not love installing it. And I was wondering, and Anaconda makes this very easy. You had actually men just mentioned that there's plans to introduce matrix multiplication in the future. Are there any other plans to integrate Python with other BLAS or MKL libraries uh, in the future to make, to integrate the scientific libraries with um, core Python? I'm not really the right person to, to answer that. Uh, my understanding is that there are several companies in the scientific numeric Python world who are competing in sort of building the best mega super jumbo sumo installers that include as much third party numerical software as, as they can manage. There are installers, both from Nthought and from uh, Continuum, that, that claim to solve your problem. I don't, I'm, I'm not a scientist in that sense myself. I have never had the opportunity to try it, but I hear from a lot of other people that they're actually doing very well with those installers. And maybe some of it is, well, the latest version of the installer will be even better. But I think you have a great deal of reason for optimism there. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I went to uh, Julie Pagano's excellent talk yesterday on imposter syndrome, and one of the things she spoke about was taking your heroes off of pedestals and making them seem like uh, regular human beings again. So the question that I wanted to ask you is, are there times in either Python or other software projects or other things you work on that you feel intimidated or like you don't have the skills that you need or any of the other things that especially people just getting started feel when they try to contribute back to the community? I have a lot of that all the time. I, I can be incredibly insecure. One news item that, that sort of touts the virtues of Perl 6 can, can, can make me sleep bad. <laughs> Someone asked me this morning while I was walking to the hotel about they have like at work they have one obnoxious Java programmer and the Java programmer is always showing off the superior tools in the Java world like he can attach a debugger to a running process and extract the stack traces and then I immediately start sort of hyperventilating and thinking oh my gosh why don't we have that? And then I realize, oh, well, yeah, the Wingware and PyCharm and uh, Komodo probably all do that too, because it's, it's just a matter of a little bit of technology. And we don't have it in the standard library, but really, we hardly have a debugger in the standard library. I'm probably the only person who, who still debugs using just PDB as it is in the standard library. So if, if you want me off, of my pedestal, I'll, I'll happily come off. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>